student occupation pro perspectives on student protests. Oh, excuse me. Um, moderated by the Historical Studies Department Chair Jeremy Barron. Um, he's been with us for a couple years now. Uh, he's an editor of a journal called The Sixties, um, and he's written a book called Bringing the War Home, which examines uh, Bader Meinhof Group in Germany versus the Weather Underground in uh, the States. Um, and it's I'm very pleased to um, have this panel and with him moderating it. So. Take it away. Very good. Okay. Um, so this is a roundtable discussion called Perspectives on the Student Occupations. And what we've done is taken five folks from the community, all students who have various levels of participation in the occupation, and then the idea is for them to reflect on dimensions of the new school occupation, student occupations in general. And then the moderator and the panelists sort of came up with four broad questions. And the idea isn't that every panelist address all questions, but that each panelist address some questions. And then the four framing questions were, what is your conception of the new school occupation within the broader occupied movement and its significance? Second, what in theory do student occupations accomplish? Third, how can in theory and practice student occupations be connected to other movements, such as workers' movements, critical race or gender movements, <coughs> et cetera? And then last, what is the role race and class play in student protests in general and in the student wings of the Occupy movement? And then the panelists to preface their talks or in the course of the talks will indicate what question they're addressing. And let me just say I'm sort of thrilled and in a bizarre way flattered to be chairing this panel. The occupation was bitter and divisive and a lot of people lost trust in other people and a lot of students lost trust in some of the faculty and evidently you didn't lose enough trust in me that you would consider me unworthy of you know doing this and then part of the reason is that though I was involved in the occupation nobody really yet knows exactly what I thought about it and I reminded this I reminded a you know a colleague of this and she said boy you're like Machiavelli and in most places that would be considered a terrible insult but, <laughs> I manipulated, but the politics department of the new school it means something altogether different and it might even be a compliment so um, in the course of this panel it might become clear you know what I believe certainly become clear what others believe and let me just say as a sort of second preface that I came here in the spring of 2009 in the kind of immediate wake of the occupation in December of 2008 and it was very hard to determine just what happened. I saw media reports, but they were rather misleading. But it was clear that it was a deeply traumatic experience for a lot of the direct participants and for the community more broadly. And there was a public forum about it hosted by, or called by, um, uh, you know, Neil the Dean at Lang. And it seemed sort of ill-conceived and ill-timed. The faculty member in the politics department said some incendiary and insulting things to the students, and the students took great offense, and the whole thing devolved into a kind of, you know, shouting match. Uh, and then I think that that panel had a kind of chilling effect on community dialogue, and you didn't hear a lot in the next two years in terms of processing just what happened. And then my intuition, without quite knowing, is that some of the problems and tensions and dynamics of the last occupation were a function of that initial trauma not being worked through in constructive ways. And then I'd like to see this as an opportunity to work through, in the sort of best psychoanalytic sense, some of what happened to kind of revitalize us as a community and strengthen us as a community. And I think that there is a therapeutic dimension of politics, and this should be about the exchange of ideas, but also a kind of healing, not in which a phony agreement is forged, but where there can be an honest and conscientious airing of perhaps divergent points of view, and we can collectively learn something about you know, shared experience from it to be in a position to do politics better. The one prerogative I'll assert is that if things get sort of testy in unconstructive ways, I'll try to, you know, cool things off, maybe jump in at interesting moments in the conversation, but for the most part, leave it to the panelists and you all to discuss things that are important to you. So the panelists are Dan Boskov, to my immediate left, he will begin, then Sophie Lewis will go next, Cecily, who's not yet here, uh, is scheduled for third, but we can slot her in later. Um, then Richard and then Adrian and then I've asked the panelists to speak for about seven minutes each and you might have to shrink your comments on the fly and then have a lot of this be you know a dialogue among ourselves so we'll begin with um, Dan and I'll start tiny okay okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before I start I should apologize I uh, made the mistake of 
taking the mega bus up to Toronto and back and caught some sort of bizarre disease uh, in the process. <laughs> so like, I know it's not pleasant to listen to me talk right now. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the question I'm going to be addressing is, uh, what is your conception of the new school occupation within the broader Occupy movement and its significance, decision making, internal democracy? So I want to say that I don't think the new school occupation uh, is uh, of world historical significance. Um, so <laughs> to talk about its violence and trauma, I think, uh, is a little bit of an exaggeration. Um, I think at most it can offer us some limited insights into the Occupy movement and the contemporary political dynamics of the left. Uh, nonetheless, I hope that these few brief remarks about what I believe I learned from the successes and failures of the experience will be of some interest. So before getting into some of the difficulties, I'd like to take a minute to talk about uh, the good things that happened at the occupation, how I and some others understood its basic purpose, and why I think it had the potential to be a worthwhile undertaking. Uh, the 95th Avenue occupation was unusual in that rather than focusing on a set of demands specifically related to our own educational institution, it was explicitly conceived of as a space for the nascent citywide student movement. And insofar as it was protect protesting anything, it was intended as a critique of our entire education system including both public and private schools. So I'd just like to start by reading uh, part of the occupation's inaugural statement. Today, the university is a supreme symbol of social and economic inequality. Skyrocketing tuition costs at public and private institutions deny us access to higher education and saddle us with crushing debt. We will reclaim this elite space and make it open to all. We will foster dialogue and build solidarity between students, workers, and others excluded or marginalized by economic and social inequalities. We will build community through the commonality of occupation. We will offer free education. We join a long tradition of student activism and struggle. We, the indebted in the future, unemployed and underemployed, stand committed to this movement for our collective lives. We invite, invite all to join us in this open occupation. Workers, students, and the millions of this city unite. So this statement points to a number of different goals. Fostering dialogue and expanding the movement, offering free education in the space, and building a community through occupation. Um, and I think it did, in fact, uh, succeed in, in these goals in some respects. Um, it opened up a radical space which did encourage new ways of people relating to each other. Um, I can't go back to the uh, student center now because it's just like horrible and clinical and depressing and nobody talks. Um, it was uh, also a really interesting open platform for radical pedagogy. Uh, we had like a whole series of really interesting speakers. We had uh, Olivier Besancino come and talk, uh, Richard Wolf, Paul Maddox Jr., et cetera, et cetera. Uh, lots, lots of really interesting discussions came out of those talks as well. Um, it was a strategic meeting point for the New York City student movement, um, particularly after uh, some of the things that happened at Baruch College um, when a lot of the CUNY students came, uh, came back uh, afterward. It was a, a really exciting place to be, which also had a real symbolic purpose. Uh, you know, the building was just surrounded by police who were obviously upset that they couldn't come inside. Um, and obviously this happened also right after Zuccotti Park had been shut down. So I, I, I do think that that sort of symbolism is, is important uh, for the movement. And uh, finally, it provided the impetus for a dialogue with maintenance workers here at the school that uh, became very fruitful during their contract negotiations later. Um, so I think there were some successes, um, but there were also many problems with the occupation. And these problems started well before the building was actually occupied. The first noteworthy challenge came during the planning process for the occupation. At that time, we had a number of semi-distinct political structures operating at the new school. We had meetings every Tuesday evening, which were for political planning. Out of these meetings grew the public new school general assemblies. Uh, and neither of these two open democratic groups uh, decided upon an occupation. Indeed, the Tuesday group decided against it, even while the direct action working group meeting elsewhere was planning how to take the space. Um, so eventually, when it became clear that this was going to happen anyway, people got behind it. Um, and tried to sell it to the New York City Student Assembly, which uh, passed uh, the uh, resolution for an occupation in a very divisive meeting that was packed with new school students that didn't normally attend these things um, and caused a break in the New York City Student Assembly. Um, so the first point is that the lack of established structures or rules about the relationship of the working groups to the larger political body allowed a minority of students supposedly concerned only with logistics to push the occupation. Uh, this proved to be a problem because it circumvented a broader discussion about the merits of such an action and what would constitute its success or what the purpose of the occupation, in fact, was. Uh, thus, when the occupation happened, it was with, uh, there was a tension between competing understandings of what it signified. Were we creating the world we wanted to see in miniature or trying to build a movement that could actually challenge the existing structures of capital? Or was the occupation simply a free space for radical self-expression whose value lay in its disruptive character? Now, I think these different visions are not mutually exclusive. Each can play a role in a holistic understanding of what an occupation means. 
The Liberty Plaza occupation combined these different tendencies with some success, though the logistics of maintaining this society in miniature largely overtook real political discussion, and I'm not convinced by David Graeber's eggshell theory of revolution. Um, However, the open and non-hierarchical nature of the movement and its insistence on plurality and a diversity of tactics also means that a small group of people can easily undermine the majority, per particularly if they neglect the strategic movement building aspect entirely. This played itself out in the 95th Avenue occupation as people using the excuse of autonomy to ignore collective decision-making processes and forego any consideration of winning over those who are not already with us. So, for example, uh, I ran the occupations, I built and then ran the occupations website, and on the first day I had two individuals approach me with a statement that they and a few of their friends had drafted, which they wanted me to put up on the site. Uh, amongst other things, this statement declared that the main significance of the occupation was that it was above a bank. Uh, so when I insisted that I could not post things on the website that claimed to represent all of us without having a, the GA agree to it, these individuals became extremely hostile, we had a 20 minute argument. Uh, where they told me I was uh, being elitist and anti-democratic for insisting on democratic procedure. Um, the infamous graffiti, likewise, was not a problem because it was a defacement of bourgeois private property. It was a problem because of its esoteric and alienating content, which came to define the occupation to the outside world. When someone writes, violence is divine on the wall, devoid of context, <clears throat> how is a generally progressive but unradicalized person who hasn't read, or in this case probably misread Benjamin, to interpret it? Uh, <laughs> when the American flag is hung upside down with the words, kill pigs, spray painted on it, is that wrong in itself? Uh, n no. This sort of self-expression is a sign of privilege, an intensely bourgeois and childish form of playing at revolution, but it is not in, in and of itself wrong. What is problematic is that it becomes the public face of an occupation, and thus one person's autonomous action radically undermines the entire project. The results are that no press can be let in, and the occupation must be securitized, with signs proclaiming, quote, no pigs, no press, no photos, playing into the fantasies of the ultra-left. And many of the occupiers themselves cannot feel comfortable in the space, let alone those curious students and faculty who wander in. Of course, pictures inevitably leak out, Gawker and Gothamist mock these juvenile displays, which give them an excuse to completely sidestep any discussion or consideration of the actual politics of the space. So in general, I think that the singular focus on disruption without any content or and without any context or positive content is a serious problem. A disruption in and of itself is not inherently productive, and we need to always be conscious about how to disrupt the ideology that locks people into the patterns of capitalist reproduction without further <coughs> alienating them. An example, one woman came to a GA and complained that her routine as a student had been disrupted. Many in the GA mocked her, saying, yes, that's exactly the point. How could this ignorant lady not understand the point? the point, right? Um, yet there was actually very little effort to give a context and rationale for the occupation, which was not immediately transparent and I think required explanation. Like, what was it about the student's routine that was so bad exactly? The only thing that spoke to this was some graffiti that said, never work, never study. Was that the message of the occupation? What were we actually protesting, since as far as we know, our current president hasn't killed a bunch of unarmed women and children? Um, it was this lack of given context that I think is the most important question. From a certain perspective, it might indeed appear absurd for people to be complaining about the occupation because they already pay such high tuition and their only space to study has been taken away from them. But the occupiers, with a few notable exceptions, did almost nothing to make this clear, to make the occupation inviting or to try and win public support. Thus, the net result is a less radicalized student body than when we began. The emphasis on, quote, radical purity ends up being the reflection of the ideological sectarianism of traditional socialist organizations. Those who see radical action as instant self-gratification and are unwilling or unable to think strategically to do the hard work of outreach and establishing dialogue ensure their ultimate failure. I think that Occupy Wall Street is so promising and also problematic because it has allowed socialists, communists, anarchists, and yes, even liberals and libertarians to work together. In, this talk, in his talk at the occupation, Professor Nikulin argued that the fault line of the left is still between Bakunin and Marx and that this fault line must be transcended. Now, whether this is fully possible is a question, but it didn't seem to be the main division within the 95th Avenue uh, occupation to me, where a number of anarchists, in responsible accordance with their own political convictions, took the lead in making the space more clean, welcome, welcoming, and serious. The line seemed rather to be between those who believe that a movement is an opportunity for collective radicalization through self-organization and participation by the systematically disempowered, on the one hand, and those who scrawled, quote, liberals go home on the bathroom mirrors and believe in a magical metaphysics of revolution through propaganda of the deed, misunderstanding the very nature of propaganda, substituting their radical purity for the participation of the masses on the other. Um, I have a few conclusions, but I, I may be over time, so uh, if you want, we can save them. Just I have pick a, your I have favorite of the conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, sure. Uh, 
so I want to say that I, I think that uh, what we should take from the fact that these autonomous actions can undermine collective action is not that we need a hierarchical top-down model for controlling the message. Uh, instead, uh, I think the relative success of Occupy Wall Street, at least in terms of encouraging public participation, confirms many critiques of the left. Its class analysis is often bad. The official organizations, socialists and communists both, are rigidly sectarian and ineffective, and their method of organizing fails to make much headway. Rather, I think the solution is actually to reaffirm a commitment to communal horizontal structures and collective decision making and action. However, in order for this to be effective, it might require codifying participation requirements and perhaps some form of enforce enforcement of decisions. Ignoring the ultimate irrelevance of the question, I think that those who accuse the administration of manipulating the vote about whether to move to Kellen had a point and identified a problem with the open GA structure. So I would suggest that before someone can vote on an important matter, maybe they would have to have participated in a few GAs and gotten to know others and become active members of the occupation community so that they are accountable for their vote. However, that vote would then be binding. And uh, insofar as this uh, might conflict with diversity of tactics in some, in some circumstances, uh, I, I, think, I think it depends on the circumstance, but uh, we may have to embrace that because I think too often diversity of tactics is tantamount to giving up on having any sort of strategy. What we actually need are creative forms of escalation that, that also serve as catalysts for expansion. People will only be radicalized through extended participation in a revolutionary movement, and any miraculous shortcuts around this process are bound to fail. Great. Thank you. accomplish um, and also trying to point out that occupations um, aren't necessarily always actually what's required. Um, anyway, um, I'm sure most of you are aware that three days ago hundreds of striking students uh, fighting austerity measures and tuition hikes were kettled for hours in broad daylight and then fined over $400 each by riot police in Quebec for failing to obey an injunction ordering them back to classes. And the situation in Quebec is being described as completely unprecedented, um, a sensation of general student and high schoolers strike in, um, in an article I saw, 184 student unions. Um, and, there's, and it's interesting partly because of the return of the factory style um, strike uh, in, the, in the sense that there's use of physical demarcations. The strikers are wearing a red square, power has responded to this sort of bodily unification hysterically. And, uh, no one displaying one has been allowed on campus for two weeks now. Um, and fascinating detail consists of some non-striking students having forced the university to reopen classes and render protests on campus illegal, um, circumstances the university itself finds highly vexing. Um, so, I mean, I don't really want to ask for a show of hands, but who thinks the, you know, few course students in Gatineau are going to win? I mean, it, it, um, I think what I'm trying to say is, um, the tide might be turning on the decline of student activism in North America. Um, but whether in this case occupation represents the next strategic step is, is moot. Um, yeah, I mean, the panel is convening on the subject of student occupations um, in their multifarious applications. Um, and I think that, you know, broadly speaking, student occupations in theory can accomplish or maintain Across across historical epochs, low fees, um, a democratic university, and 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 the ideal of free education, um, but the action in Quebec is much more reminiscent of the tactic of the flying picket, uh, not only because it draws out yet another potential identity between the erstwhile factory and today's university, which is the main point of the edu factory collectors. Um, perspective on, on, the, on the future of the radical university, but because it calls into question a certain uh, reductive hierarchy of radicality where occupation is at the peak. Um, so I'm taking some of these thoughts from Elise Thorburn, who's a collaborator of it, like Jeremy, 
Um, this is a plug alert in the Journal for Occupied Studies I've started up, and I, I edit it with Hannes Scharin and others. And I just wanted to um, slip in here before I continue a, a call for submissions to complete our second volume. Elise is organizing a conference at her university in Toronto next weekend, and it's called The University is Ours, a conference on struggles within and beyond the neoliberal university. And I think, I think it would be a good idea for the new school, uh, <laughs> particularly in its ragged post-occupation state, to go, um, to go perhaps on mass. But, um, right, the UCOR uh, situation that is ongoing notwithstanding, it's um, probably best to start things um, when talking about student organizing a little bit bleakly, um, because there's nothing worse for politics than the demented optimism of unjustified pride in a movement that's barely there. Um, if the university was once a hotbed of revolutionary ambition, it too seems to have suffered um, the fate of broader culture. Um, and that, uh, it seems difficult to believe that students were at the fore of a movement that brought the French state to the brink of collapse in 1968. And it's, uh, I mean, unimaginable to those of us who came of age during the plagues of Reagan and Bush, to borrow a phrase from Annie DeFranco. And I'm personally born too late and in the wrong place to have studied at an institution that provided foot soldiers for Quebec City and Seattle, but I gather that organizing towards those conventions actually took place overwhelmingly away from campuses. They have generally um, campuses that have ceased to be hubs of rad radical agitation in the last four decades, but I think, uh, as I already suggested, <coughs> that they are displaying some signs in recent years of this changing. Um, but to lament this decline is not to suggest that the university is somehow outside of the broader political economy um, and therefore to be expected to be a key source of challenge um, to the status quo. But neither do we want to dismiss how universities remain institutions where a certain amount of experimentation is still possible, where some opportunities do still arise to enter into engagements discontinuous with the univers universalizing telos of capital. And we, um, we can look back to 2009 California and uh, for me most most easily to the UK of 2010 and 2011 where um, every university seemed to be in occupation. Um, and sure, they, these were defensive efforts to preserve the status quo in the face of a bold new incursion from the right. Um, we face the increasingly paranoid and securitized institution of the university which sees itself as a concentration of resources, a treasure house in which potent ideas can only be unlocked by possession of the right credentials. Um, but also, there are signs that it might be possible to transform the university. Um, and I, I'm, I'm focusing on, well, I actually won't be able to develop them, I'll just say there are three nodes, <laughs> uh, new forms of assembly that have emerged as efforts to challenge the top-down governance structures of our universities. And secondly, the idea of militant research um, or efforts to radicalize the production of knowledge. And thirdly, um, we could point to efforts to wrest academic knowledge production from the hands of corporate publishers. Um, and I think, I think what I'm saying is that none of these prefigurative forms of fight back against the neoliberalization of, un of the university actually requires occupations. They express the ideal of free education, um, where, of course, free exploits its double meaning in English to the full. Um, at the Oxford Education Campaign, um, we, we held free uh, universities with uh, um, sort of uh, centering on the sentiment that free education, this is my, James, my friend James's quote, free education is not something that can be achieved by resisting the most recent steps in the long march towards total marketization, but by moving against the institutional frameworks that determine what education should contain or should do which are so deeply embedded in the notion of marketable skills and corporate box ticking that they've become a seemingly ineluctable condition of education for those of us inside those institutions. A truly free education requires first and above all uh, an act of imagination which refuses to be conditioned on the premises of education as it already exists. Um, the, the, the distinction I wanted to make, and I'll, I'll close here, is between um, the idea of a sort of grateful occupation and uh, an occupation of ingrates. And I, I think my, 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 my critique of the new school uh, occupation um, might be summed up as, as, as um, 
the fact that it was a, a grateful occupation. Um, um, I, I want to go into that, but I know I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm over time. I thought you were going to say it was an occupation of grateful. What do you mean by being a grateful occupation? Well, the grateful occupation is the occupation not really worthy of the name, where students delighted at their own impunity. Um, and this is dangerous when combined with their sort of university culture-derived desire to repeat or emulate that, that annexation of educational space um, created, by, created by private institutions, private neoliberal <coughs> universities, um, sort of expresses their unconscious desire to have a purer, sort of absolutely non-public zone within which to, to self-educate. To self and this is what Dan is describing with, um, um, with the sort of the, the sense you had within the, the occupation that you were in a private members party. Um, and I think George Cofensis is absolutely right when, when he says um, that it is, <laughs> well, uh, that it is immoral to uh, repay your student uh, debt because crucially we must regain, re remain ungrateful um, and seriously work towards configuring the ideal of the autonomous university um, um, because in theory, uh, the ungrateful occupation would be the starting point for throwing wide open the doors of education. Um, ungratefulness in this context would be to take education too seriously, to be grateful for the privatized, instrumentalized, marketized travesty of it. Um, <coughs> this ethos would dare to think of what it might mean to actually free education in the ways that I've described, um, and to understand that um, as a student, not only aren't we getting a good deal, um, but we are laboring for the production and reproduction of ourselves in the image of capital and class conflict. Um, cool. Thank you. And Cecily, you're up next. Are you ready? You came a little late. You're yep. prepared? Okay, I'm, go for it. I'm ready. I may have accidentally just... And then sort of seven to eight minutes is the target. Okay. okay. Bear with me. I accidentally erased my Google Docs, so... Um, so on November 17th, uh, more than 200 students from across the five boroughs, as spoken before, launched a student occupation, 95th Ave, the New School Study Center, uh, a symbolic location as the space had been won in large part through prior student occupation. Um, that night, I rejoiced with students from throughout the city that I had met through Occupy. Looking around, I was confident that the eviction of Zuccotti just two days prior could not halt this movement. We'll just move somewhere else. I thought we were on the brink of making history. Students for a democratic society had showed us in the 60s that students, when united, can change the discourse, can change reality, can be powerful enough to stop wars. I thought, given the current political and economic debate, um, aiming for restructuring of our current student debt system or commentary on free higher education uh, was certainly possible. Uh, with the cry, we are the 99%, Occupy Wall Street had changed the game. We would no longer fight this fight alone. Different constituencies would no longer serve as meager pawns in the facade that is our political system. We would band together, demand justice for all, assert that an injury to one is an injury to all. But when I started my time at Occupy Wall Street, um, I showed up at Tompkins Square to largely the political normative. Um, it was largely educated males, uh, largely white, while there were women and people of color. Uh, it was pretty evident that people of uh, the welfare class or the working class um, were largely not at that debate. As we spoke and moved forward about what the occupation would look like to us, um, we planned on staging an occupation that would serve as a, a rallying cry. It was believed that um, once we got the cry out there, that we are the 99%, that people would seemingly trickle in, unions and uh, people of color, uh, various communities in New York that had previously been organized. Though when I got to the occupation, I once again did not see that as the case. Um, uh, at Occupy Wall Street, it seemed to me that to truly understand the systems that you had to navigate, the GAs and all the various confusing uh, hand signals, etc., cetera, uh, you had to be there pretty often. You needed to be involved in working groups. You needed to be able to show up to several meetings per week and that wasn't generally to me uh, as seen as a, a possibility. Uh, the people that are most oppressed uh, by the 1%, the people that are most oppressed by our system, um, 
minorities and the working class or welfare class, um, it seemed to me to not have a viable outlet into the occupation, into the GA structures. And as time wore on, um, it looked as if the conversation um, held far less and less people of color uh, or people of the working class. So when I uh, arrived at the student occupation at the new school, um, I, I was really inspired. Uh, I became certain of two things, that um, even without the lack of a centralized location, uh, the occupation would last. And uh, the second, the ideal of Occupy, the 99% uniting together to challenge existing political and economic structures, uh, could be closely approaching a reality. For the first time as I looked around at our occupation, the room was filled with diversity. There were white students next to students that make up the wide range of the term people of color. There were state students and private students, even high school students. There were students uh, that were normative, uh, youth as well as older students. Um, there were people that uh, had been a part of the occupation that were concerned with student debt that weren't students. Um, there were people with various spiritual and um, experiences, cultural experiences, um, and I, I really thought that we could be at that moment on the brink of truly understanding what it means to bypass uh, class and race to really unite together and really form what is the idea of the 99%. However, uh, that honeymoon period I think quickly came to a halt even as uh, quickly as the occupation's first all citywide general assembly. Um, the first disagreements were about the cigarette smoking indoors and the graffiti on the walls. Um, some members came forward and expressed uh, their ideology in uh, individual autonomy, um, that any authority is a type of repression and that each person has the right to challenge that repression through a diversity of tactics or whatever means necessary. Um, many of the people who were there felt that if eviction could be the response to uh, the personal autonomy of, of writing on the walls and smoking, that a individual autonomy should be compromised for the ability of the group in order to stay there. It was an all citywide general assembly. The idea was that the all citywide student general assembly would now have a physical space to come and uh, discuss and plan actions in the same way that Zuccotti had been the physical space for uh, all citywide participants to come and discuss action, etc. Um, so we have a problem right there with the individual autonomy. I think that underlying that problem was the value of the community. Many of the students there were from CUNY where uh, the results that they had wanted to achieve had been done so by standing together and working together and to form various communities throughout that school and be a voice of power. Uh, the next big issue uh, came with the kill the pigs statements. Uh, I think it was the second night. And uh, growing up in Southeast Texas, I had always uh, been understanding of issues concerning racism, but never had I been uh, sincerely frightened or concerned that there would be a race war. That night, uh, a man approached the white woman that was writing on the walls, and she said, I don't feel safe being in this space if you're going to write that on the walls. Um, she replied with her ideology about personal autonomy, and it quickly uh, ignited into an argument where the man said, you don't understand, um, I'm black. What will happen if if white officers come in here and take us out is they'll remove all of you white people, they'll leave us black people here and they'll come back and they'll beat the shit out of us. And so there was a concern there that was not addressed concerning a cultural perspective um, shifted, I guess, for the value of personal autonomy. Uh, by the end of the discussion, there was literally a line of black students facing a line of white students. Um, there's about seven and a half minutes. Sure. So you know. uh, further, I guess there were issues about safe space. Um, 
safe space being women, um, people of color, people of non-normative um, sexual identities. We wanted a place where we could assert our sort of safety. Uh, that became an issue. Uh, there became issues of fuck your identity politics is divisive and unnecessary as capitalism. The overthrow of capitalism would eliminate all inequality and render these definitions futile. Um, I guess in essence, I, I believe that Occupy has brought people together and issues to the forefront that never would have occurred before. But I think the New School occupation, like the broader OWS movement, suffers from an unwillingness to part with strict idealism. Um, the reality is, is there are people starving now. There are people who experience a greater truckload of the oppression now. People who need results now. There is no reason that we can't have an idealistic vision um, as an endpoint and work on changing things in people's lives that need to be changed now. If we are to last long enough to crack, to take a crack at the system, for any of us to have our visions possibly realized, then we need to understand and accept that we need to uh, embrace the concerns of the general public at large now. And, a tr and I, I think that the way to do this is through a true diversity of tactics. Not just one of lip service that allows people to justify violent tactics, but a diversity of tactics that allows us to critique our system through systematic alternatives, such as occupations, but also allows for changes to be made in lives that need changing right now through demands. Clear, concrete goals that we achieve for people who need changes now. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to Richard and then end with Adrian. Okay. Yeah. Um, the comments I want to make are um, fairly brief and I hope modest. Speak um, up a little bit. Oh, yeah. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So in uh, in an earlier panel, I spoke briefly about uh, occupation as a moment of glory, and Dick Bernstein took me to task on this. Um, I should say now that I think it necessary for us to distance ourselves from this idea of glory. Last week, Andrew Schapp spoke at the Radical Democracy Conference about his subject, the Aboriginal Tent Embassy. He said that to speak on it was uncomfortable because of his privilege as a white Australian. He also said that it should be uncomfortable. From a similar place of discomfort, I speak here. On the evening of November 17th, I was in jail. I was released within 36 hours of being arrested. And certainly my own experiment in seeking the feeling of glory in an act like fighting with a policeman over a barricade was naive. More importantly though, um, What, it, what I did, I did because I could afford to. A recent conversation with a friend uh, left me with a bit more than regret to reflect on about the event. This friend reminded me that that evening would have gone very differently for many, many other members of the student body at the NSSR. But because of my citizenship status, the fact that I am a cisgendered man, my race, I made it through just fine, actually, all things considered. I hope it's understood that I do not wish to justify jails or the police. Rather, I just want to offer a brief reflection on how, how occupations themselves create conditions of privilege. Three years ago, I was involved in the occupations at UC Santa Cruz, and there um, it took three days for the occupiers who experienced, say, a moment of glory when they seized the building and built barricades around it. It took three days for them to open it to people who weren't occupiers, to people they didn't know by name, to people they didn't know. Now that didn't happen for us, and it's probably better. Um, but I think it's clear to all of us that conditions of privilege are reproduced within the occupation. It might be worth asking how the act of occupation itself create some of those privileged conditions. There's something productive about asking the question in the most pragmatic, hard-headed way, who can afford to get arrested? The answer to this question expands not only the power of occupations to be disruptive, it is also an index of one's privilege. For that reason, a pragmatic approach to this increasingly inevitable question of arrest 
might well serve as a starting point for thinking about privilege within occupations. Thank you. So to conclude, Adrian. Uh, <clears throat> thank you to all the organizers of this conference for inviting me, and thank you, Jeremy, for moderating our panel. Um, I wanted to take off from sort of a different point than everyone else. Um, <clears throat> it's a specific concern to me because in the sort of post-New School occupation time, uh, <clears throat> I've been trying to figure out um, for myself um, sort of which ways, which different directions to go with organizing, how organizing and Occupy um, can fit with me theoretically and, um, and all those kind of issues. So uh, I wanted to talk about a specific, specific issue, <clears throat> which is the rupture which occurred in the final days of the occupation between new school organizers who had been involved in the planning and carrying out of the occupation. For those who are not aware, uh, in the wake of the occupation, the new school contingent of the All City student group responsible for organizing and carrying out the initial occupation of 95th Avenue <clears throat> split into two factions generally along the lines of those who voted to leave the study center in the final general assembly and those who voted to stay. The divided vote was not the cause of the divide but only a symptom of an already growing antagonism and infighting, which during the occupation took the form of a debate over tactic and strategy, but was in retrospect clearly due to conflicting underlying theoretical commitments. <clears throat> For those who are aware, rhetoric from both sides has only served to obfuscate uh, these unarticulated underlying commitments. Statements have been issued by both groups denouncing the actions of the other. <clears throat> character attacks and threats have been made, charges of reformist and anarchist, as though anarchists were a pejorative and not a compliment, are hurled back and forth <laughs> either by the original organizers or those who have now taken sides. Uh, <clears throat> one group has remained committed to student organizing, the other has abandoned it altogether and gone on to plan and carry out direct actions throughout New York City. The confusion arises because both groups, both groups remain staunchly anti-capitalist, revolutionary, and uh, students organizing in both groups maintain a variety of political identities, including communist and anarchist and a whole broad range of other combinations of those. Uh, <clears throat> communiques from each side don't do much to clarify. One side writes, we reject what rejects the possibility of doing politics productively, while the other side responds, the most recent split in the nascent struggle against capitalism and the state in New York City has fallen among those who have daring and those who have fear. Uh, <clears throat> neither of these are very illuminating. <laughs> how, then, <clears throat> how then can we define the fissure that caused the eventual cleavage of these two groups? The aftermath of the most recent New School occupation saw the division not of the left versus the ultra-left, communist versus anarchist, reformist versus, versus revolutionary, but the division, um, in my opinion, of programmatist organizers versus those who are oriented uh, towards the various currents of communization. Uh, programmati programmatism is an orientation toward activism which is based on the identity of the worker, or in this case, the student. With the, advance of <clears throat> with the advance of real subsumption in the industrial form of the, of the factory during the later half of the 19th century, we saw a new antagonism of the worker versus capitalism, which, which reached its height in the Russian Revolution. In this cycle of struggles, central, uh, central is the independent worker's identity. Here, forms the struggle, here, the forms of struggle actually become internal to capitalism as the relation becomes mediated through unions, social welfare, and other forms of Keynesian control. These revolutions tend to reinforce capitalism, encouraging the passage from formal to real subsumption through socialist accumulation and lead to the theology of labor and the oxymoron of the worker's state. In the programmatist mindset, <clears throat> once we have the correct form of, of Leninist party, workers' council, etc., communism will unfold. The central problematic in the programmatic 
epoch is the growing over of everyday struggles into revolution. Programmatists envision a transition to communism, which is to take place after the revolution and the taking over of the state. What we find in communization is often a weird mixing up of insurrectionist anarchism, the communist ultra-left, post-autonomous, anti-political currents, groups like the Invisible Committee, as well as more explicitly communizing currents such as theory communist and endnotes. Communization poses struggle as immediate, imminent, and anti-identity. Immediate in the sense that there is no transition to communism. There is no stage of state-administered socialism required before communism can be achieved. Imminent, imminent in the sense that communization requires that we start thinking communism from within the imminent conditions of global capitalism rather than from a putatively radical or communist outside. And anti-identity in the sense that communization theory uh, refuses the old identity models of Marxism, the working class or the proletariat, as well as the new models of identity politics, and instead prefer the language of contemporary theory, forms of life, whatever singularities you guys have all heard or these been thrown around. <clears throat> I want to point out that neither of these can be thought of as more radical. Uh, indeed, historically, many of the ultra-leftist groups have organized under programmatist models uh, therefore, as much as one group would like to claim and do in a communique that demonization of the ultra-left by the left is nothing new, implying they're the more radical ultra-left, is, this is simply uh, not true. Having said that, programmatism uh, finds itself in crisis due to the end of the programmatic workers' movement, the disappearance of positive working class identity, and the absence of any kind of uh, workers' power on the horizon, uh, it is no longer possible to imagine a transition to communism on the basis of a prior victory of the working class as a working class. Um, furthermore, programmatist models are based on flawed conceptions of the state, which have come about due to Marx's shifting and indeed unworked out view of the state. Uh, Marx's ambiguity has led some Marxists to view the state uh, as a subject, still retaining the Hegelian influence in Marx's early writing, especially in critique of Hegel's philosophy of the right, or uh, as is characteristic of the dogmatic approach as an object, which is the neutral tool to be controlled by class di dictatorship, be it the bourgeoisie or the proletariat. And then you had seven and a half minutes to see it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Contemporary theory has shown the limits of these models and has developed the conception of the state as a social relation rooted in the very relations of production and therefore not relegated to superstructure. This view rules out the possibility of the dictatorship of the proletariat and a transition to communism through the state and reaffirms the immediacy and imminence of communization. <clears throat> um, Communization has its own problems in the sense that it has the ten tendency to become messianic. Here I define messianic as the belief that, it, that an individual or an individual's or a group's actions can overcome the reproduction of the capitalist class relation or abolish, abolish the state through their own actions. Uh, messianum, messianism uh, leads to a, attempts to be alternative um, being alternative consists in the belief that we can, with limited numbers of people, establish relations within the world of capitalism, which would uh, be already a prefiguration of communism, uh, even if one doesn't use this term. Uh, <clears throat> misreadings of communization texts, especially to Kuhn's The Call, have led to this kind of alternativism. And indeed, this current of communization was visible in the New School occupation. Those who take uh, an alternative approach to communization, though, miss the warning, the warnings of the call, in the call, that uh, by dint of seeing the enemy as a subject that faces us, instead of a feeling, feeling it as a relationship that holds us, we confine ourselves to the struggle against confinement. We reproduce under the pretext of an alternative, the worst kind of dominant relationships. Uh, this reproduction of dominant relationships during the occupation has led to its biggest critique, and some would say its failure. Um, <clears throat> the triumph of, of real subsumption, which integrates the reproduction of the proletariat to the self-reproduction of capital, seems to allow very little space or time for resist 
sense, even though we don't think in terms, even if we don't think in terms of real subsumption, but rather global dominance of capitalism or empire, we still have to confront the issues of whether it can be defeated and how. Um, I, <clears throat> for myself, I would, I would argue um, here for a third way, a way which avoids the limitations of programmatism and also avoids the messianism of some currents of communization. Uh, I would argue for the, nece the necessity of a communization which sees itself as the proliferation of an intransitive politics or the idea of an emancipation any or the idea of emancipation and equality no longer as objectives of drawn out program, a strategy and or a transition, but as matters of imminent practice and a fusion of means and ends that seems to abrogate uh, the entire temporal framework of reform and revolution. And that's a, that's a position taken by the journal EndNotes, if you guys are familiar with that. <coughs> uh, and would also say that capitalism, uh, capital is not abolished for communism, but through communism, more precisely through its production. Indeed, communist measures must be distinguished from communism. They are not embryos of communism, but rather they are its production. Uh, there is not a period of transition. Um, there is not a period of transition. It is the revolution. Communization is only the communist production of communism. So we'll turn it over to questions and comments, and just, I mean, an observation of the panel. I mean, nobody knew what anybody was going to say, but it's easy to read this as a kind of anatomy of failure. And then there are sort of clusters of opinion. I mean, two folks, Cecily and Richard, you know, said the occupation turned out to be a kind of exercise in privilege doomed my demography, that the absence of a diversity of subjectivities and perspectives gave it a certain sort of cast and tenor and set forward a kind of political limit that can't be overcome. You spoke to a failure of communication and sort of externalizing the politics through a broader community and internally of democratic process. You talked about a failure of dueling and each inadequate theoretical and philosophical commitments, and then you spoke of it as a kind of grateful occupation that tried to produce a free version of an unfree educational experience on exclusionary lines. That probably doesn't exhaust the possible anatomies of failure. I think it's good to be reminded of some of the positive things that happened that you spoke to in the beginning, Cecily spoke to, to some extent. So why don't we now just, you know, invite um, questions for the panelists or your own comment or brief assessment of whatever piece of this you want to address. And then, you know, keep your comments short, you know, but I say less with more, I mean more with less, you know, be, be concise. <laughs> I mean, I, I, my own perspective, I'll jump in with at some point, but why don't we just open it up. I'll go. Please. Uh, this, I'm going to like humble my way through this, but like, I mean, I was involved in the occupation too. I, I, I think that a lot of the things that were just said in this panel are accurate and are interesting. I mean, I disagree with some of the terminology sometimes, but I think that, that you know, we're, <coughs> we're on broadly the same page in this whole post-mortem. But I also think that it's really funny and in some way misguided to do this kind of like mea culpa. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it, it's difficult constituting a democratic community out of nothing, especially when we operate in a society in which we're not trained to have those or exercise those impulses whatsoever. And like, you know, I don't think that means we need to sit around and, and sort of feel bizarrely guilty about the ways that it went wrong. It just means that we have to do this over and over and over and over again and make it better each time. Okay, thanks. Other folks? Um, so I want to speak to an issue that, at least in this panel, hasn't come to the forefront, but in discussions leading up to it certainly have this distinction between violent protesters, a uh, term used for people who are being labeled quite liberally and without much substance as anarchists, and nonviolence. Um, non and I'm wondering whether or not whether or not that binary actually one actually exists, 
why it's being invoked, and how it can be used to legitimize state, uh, state violence and any other sort of abuse. Specifically, with the, um, specifically as this question applies to students who have already been stigmatized by police forces, um, namely Muslim and South Asian students, I wonder if um, being compelled to identify with the cops as an extension of the 99%, for example, actually helps me at all. As a student who has grown up in the city with a profound fear of the spectacle of police brutality, and also the repeated presence of profiling and harassment. I'm not entirely, sh um, I'm not entirely sure what this um, maneuver by a by a sort of um, quote unquote peace police movement does, and I'm not entirely sure how it should sit with me when they when it. Um, when this starts being, when a discourse of identity politics starts being imported into it. I mean, would anybody like to address that specifically? And I don't know who you thought on the panel necessarily reified the violence on violence distinction, but... I think I heard the term violent tactic uh, um, towards the end. I think that Dan brings up a good point. Is the When we see someone write, kill the pigs on a flag, is that, just, is that violent or is it juvenile? I'm very, very concerned about this word, violent. Um, and why it's being used. Anybody want to address that? I could say that um, I, I felt personally torn uh, in the moment in the sense that I understood where students were coming from in their analysis of the police state and having been beaten pretty badly by police myself. I'm not exactly enthused. Um, but I mean, for me, I guess the point was is no i i don't think it's a violent act in itself i think that uh i had um <coughs> a value of free expression uh that i was grappling with on the other side of that though uh brought up by the anecdote i sort of gave can that expression in our current reality in our current political circumstance be turned into a violent act, not on behalf of the writer, but for instance, if the police did come in and if this individual was beaten uh, because he was targeted and profiled as a young black man. Um, and, at, and at that point, I say free expression is a value that needs to be upheld, but at what point can we as individuals working together in a community silence a portion of our personal autonomy for the betterment and safety um, and the life of a group. If I might respond, because I was one of those students who, who, was, who objected to that spray paint that night. I was one of the three students who stood on a, that line. Um, it's, I think that's, that sets up my question entirely. Um, I asked about the use of the word violent in general. I'm not talking about free expression. I'm talking about what, um, about the implications of calling something violent because the police use that as justification to enter spaces. To, um, and I think you might be able to speak a little more profoundly to uh, the distinction between nonviolent and violent being used violently against other pro demonstrators. Yeah, I mean, I can speak. Um, I mean, first of all, Cecily, you, you spoke, you've used this discourse a lot in other, you know, in your interview on Democracy Now! and other publications that you've made in statements. Uh, uh, about your experience, um, and, and and I think this is part of a larger discourse that we're seeing. People like Jim Miller, Chris Hedges, um, and I and I wanted to point specifically to Chris Hedges, um, his his article, "The Cancer in Occupy." This is the image that accompanied that article. Okay, this is the larger framework in which we're operating. Talking about the large Occupy movement. This is what Chris Hedges thinks anarchists are. This is a colonial discourse, this is an imperialist discourse, this is a white supremacist discourse, and as Cesar once said, fascism is colonialism come home. And I know, I know we can talk a lot, there's a lot of privilege within anarchist circles, a lot of anarchists, are, anarchist spaces are very white, and so what does it mean to be talking about using this colonial discourse now against, against a group you know, like, like anarchists? Uh, I myself as an anarchist, I don't appreciate being called a cancer. Um, I don't appreciate people saying that, um, 
people saying, uh, you know, legitimating state violence against me as a trans person in the name of identity politics, um, in the name of safe space, um, legitimating violence against me, legitimating violence against people who are perceived as Muslim. Um, and I think that that is a vile discourse. Um, in Denver, Colorado, for instance, there was literally a witch hunt against violent protesters in the name of nonviolence. There, there was a witch hunt against so-called anarchists, and, and many of them were anarchists, and I myself am an anarchist. I'm an anarchist. Um, there were people literally attacking protesters because they were saying, in the name of nonviolence, um, turning people's names over to the police at general assemblies. Uh, and I'm not saying this is what happened at the, at, at, at the New School occupation, but this is part of the larger discourse in which nonviolence as a national conversation is being framed, which is explicitly complicit in the language of the war on terror. Um, and as a trans person, to be told that the police are part of the 99% and I am a terrorist because I'm an anarchist. <laughs> that is disgusting. That is absolutely horrific. Um, and that the police who, who lock trans people in wrong gender cells, who torture them and rape them and deny trans people in, in incarceration access to medical treatment, um, and to then say that the police are our friends, they are part of the 99%. They are a military occupation in this city. The fact, that they, the fact that they occupy a certain class position does not excuse them from being part of a military occupation. And what's more, um, this feeds into a discourse of empire. Who are we supposed to be framing our demands for? Who am I, to, who am I as someone who is only here but for empire to frame my, uh, frame my demands to? I don't want to legitimize the structure that has, uh, that has turned me against my own people. I don't want that. I know that a number of people need to, you know, need to struggle, for, uh, struggle for state recognition in order for, uh, for, welfare, for their welfare to be, um, to be accounted for, their, for their capacity to represent themselves politically to be accounted for. But at the same time, I do not know what to do with a movement that is starting to delimit the capa my capacity to resist by saying that I need to pose concrete demands to a government that repeat that is uh, that has in recent history you know, inv invaded three countries and invaded several others under the radar um, it's it's a uh, you know this is a uh, I mean there's a discourse, I mean, I understand that we're speaking from the position of the university, but as students, we're also in a position to know, to know, that, the West, to know that the West is no longer the motor of history. Why is it that we are continually, uh, why are we continually framing this discourse in a way that reifi reifies the position, uh, the position of the West and the position of our own welfare, the position of our own politics? I see this in, uh, in a lot of the left re um, references to leftist politics right now. Socialists. Mar uh, Marxists, anarchists, uh, liberals, and libertarians—all subject positions that cannot, that have yet to grasp, uh, yet to grasp how they can be, for, uh, how they can become firmly rooted in the substance of empire, colonialism, and imperialism. Additional comments from the floor or from um, the panel? Well, just in, uh, on this uh, on this question of what constitutes violence, right? I mean, I think that you're totally right. Um, I think that, you know, this discourse of the police being part of the 99% is insane, right? Um, and and I think that, you know, and, and it's not, so uh, when you're talking about nonviolence, I think it's, it, like, it's clearly not a question of, like, principle, right? Because, like, anti-violence is just clearly justified, like, within the system, right? I think it's it's mostly uh, a question of strategy, right? Um, so, like, at what at what stages of struggle and in what contexts is violence uh, going to advance the struggle, and in what situations is it actually going to set us back, right? Rather than setting us free. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think I think that like in in a lot of situations, actually, nonviolence has a potential to uh, to bring out the the structural violence of the state uh, in in a way that is is often obscured by. Uh, you know this sort of like fetishization of street skirmishes or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, fuck the police, but like they're, <laughs> they're not what we should really be focusing on, <laughs> in, in my opinion, right? Like, I mean, I mean, they're they're the henchmen. So, uh, like, I guess my my concern with with uh, with uh, this 
infatuation that I sometimes see with the police is that I think it misses the it misses like the point <laughs> in some respects. But that isn't to say that like the NYPD is not like a horribly racist like paramilitary organization that like should be dismantled. That I think that's clear. But the question is just how do we actually go about doing that? Anybody else? We can go back over here. Somebody else who hasn't spoken already. So it's from some of the comments and from some of the papers as well. Um, I, I think what I've gathered is that there's a distinction to be made between an immediate um, kind of atemporal uh, challenge or approach to communization and one that insists that there's some sort of uh, organization or steps to be gone through before we can conceive of what communization would be or uh, start building to achieve it. Um, and I wanted to, um, I guess, ask a question about which, which is more messianic, right? the one that thinks we can, uh, in an atemporal sequence, achieve communization in the immediate, or, or I, I just I missed I miss the point about um, how, how I, I guess I just don't see how it almost seems like a definition of messianism. Um, um, to collapse time and achieve a, a result of uh, transfigurative freedom in, in an immediate sense. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, I'm having trouble grasping it, so I guess it's really just an exclusive um, perspective. Uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to, I want a little more input. Why don't we take your question on oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm good. Yep. Uh, yeah, so there's, <clears throat> there's different, uh, you know, in this communization literature from uh, to Kuhn and notes theory communists. There's there's different conceptions of what communization actually is. Uh, the all the you know more communist stuff um, uh, criticizes the to Kuhn literature, the coming insurrection, and uh, the call for being messianic, and just that it's saying um, <clears throat> that that there is this possibility of actually creating a situation outside of capitalist social relations in now, right? Um, the, so that's the, the messianic position. <coughs> the, the, what I would say the, the non-messianic position is, is the idea that, um, that these situations um, like the New School Occupation or like other uh, sort of attempts at communization um, <clears throat> can be sort of learning experiences, right? So like um, you're not, uh, <clears throat> there is no, there is no situation outside of capital social relations, but you, you, there's, you create communism, like communism isn't the um, end goal is the process. And so you have to be um, building and learning. And I, I guess my whole my my point in in sort of op, uh, bringing up this distinction between the more programmatist um, side and the communization side isn't to <clears throat> isn't to deny that form is an important conversation and an important debate, um, but just to sort of maybe bend the stick to the other side a little bit and saying like, what are we actually trying to do? When we when we are taking over these spaces, what are we trying to do when we're occupying, you know, Zuccotti Park? We should be thinking of it as a as an imminent situation, trying to imagine and create, uh, you know, com communism from inside this capitalist situation, and not thinking of it as but as you, a. But you yourself <clears throat> just said there's no outside, right? That it's social relations of capital all the way down. So I, I don't I actually don't see the possibility of logically maintaining that position. Uh, well, you can think of it as um, something that, that exists at the margin. You can think of it uh, in sort of like a negative, instead of a prefigurative, uh, prescriptive. Politics is more of a limit um, idea. Um, I think you know there's there's all kind of different approaches to it, and I think uh, that. The whole, I think, the whole reason why um, you have a bunch of, you know, anarchist kids like running around screaming about the the uh, you know forms of life and and the the what, you know 
whatever singularity and all these terms is is because there's sort of a big muddle of theory right now trying to think about this and I all I'm saying is I'm not saying that there's even particularly a perfect answer but what I'm saying is that it's worth um, it's a project worth carrying out um, carrying forward in theory and trying to figure it out and that's why I'm trying to I'm trying to think um, past uh, programmatist models but but not end up in this like messianic thing. That's all I'm saying. Can I just speak to this briefly? Um, because uh, one, one thing that I tried to draw out in my paper a little bit um, is I think that um, you know th there are some critiques where it's like uh, this this whole uh, uh, autonomous idea is completely like incoherent because it's just like make-believe, right? You know, it just ignores the real structures of capital and like for, forsakes the hope of actually like trying to transform social relations for this process of like teaching ourselves about what communism might be like, right? Um, what I was trying to argue is that I actually, uh, I think that these things can, can be complementary, right? Like you, you, can, you can understand um, something like Zuccotti Park as part of a, uh, an attempt to build a larger anti-capitalist movement, right, rather than just uh, the sort of like self-contained uh, mimicking of what we, what we would want the world to look like, right? Um, but I think what happened at the, uh, uh, and uh, I tried to uh, also point out like a, a, a third function uh, that an occupation might have, which is just to disrupt the normal routines of capital, right? And I think that this uh, third element was what actually uh, was, mostly emphasized by some of these people in the occupation. I don't think that uh, the communization was actually there, right? Because that actually impl <laughs> implies uh, trying to, you know, have a community and, and, like, live by those ideals rather than just sort of, like, enacting your own bourgeois individualist fantasies about what, like, being in a revolution is like. Um, so uh, I, I just want to challenge the distinction a little bit because I, I think that, like, both moments of the process are actually necessary. Um, and, I, and I think that, like, like I said, I think Occupy Wall Street uh, has, like, has taught, the left, or at least should have taught the left something about, about the importance of building these sort of structures that allow people to participate. It's like super important. Um, but that can't be the end in itself. Sophie, maybe you'd like to speak to this by laying out what you meant by ungrateful occupation and what its positive attributes are. I and mean, we're sort of talking about what transformative does or doesn't happen in that liberated space and what the status of liberation in that space would be made there. Does your thinking resonate with any of this? Um, yeah, I, uh, <coughs> universities are, are obviously contradictory because they're, because I think we think of education as, as, the, as the most, as a precious thing and, um, and the role of the university in sort of reproducing Capital is, is not is not total, um, and we and and we we find within the university um, those vestiges of possibility to um, to experiment and to create discon discontinuities. As I said, um, the the need to be um, ungrateful within the neoliberal university is is probably um, is it, I mean that as as you picked up on um, a bit facetiously, um, it's important to ask what it would mean to posit a space in which the logic of acquisitive concentration around around knowledge was was itself rejected, um, and and the commitment to um, to a community is key for that rejection. Um, in a way, I I saw. I saw the behaviour of um, uh, an unfortunate um, kind of dominant group within the new school occupation as as really as really grateful for uh, for the privilege that is created around uh, around people like us by by, neo, by the neoliberal university. Um, so I don't know how to speak to these uh, discussions about. Communization. I, I thought we were convening to talk about occupations, and I was <laughs> um, I was hoping we would discuss um, 
what in theory they can accomplish, whether whether they are still a relevant strategy, what occupations um, that people in the room have experienced have have been good for and not so good for. In my in my experience, they um, when when they are good, they um, they have a prefigurative element, yes, but they also um, in in a cumulative way made up of small, seemingly um, not very powerful instantiations of sort of, um, you know, non-commercial publishing or um, anti-hierarchical assembly or um, kind of militant research strategies actually amount to something that is threatening to, um, to the logic of um, a sort of national and transnational higher education as we can, as as we see in Quebec right now, given that given that hundreds and hundreds of students are actually being um, contained for hours on end and, and fined, which 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 suggests to me a um, a degree of terror at what the, the, the well organized, not necessarily sort of occupying forces of students and faculty can actually um, can actually achieve. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry. Okay, that's good. Other folks? Um, I was just going to speak to this as well. Um, <clears throat> I th think that as somebody who, as, as you called out, sort of uh, calls for a dualistic process of both, uh, I guess, calling for concrete demands, but also uh, setting up and exploring different systematic ways to try to uh, in whatever way possible, work outside the system, as you kind of cleared up, there's not exactly a way to do that. But uh, I agree, Adrian, that um, upon going to the occupation, like, I do tend to be more of a demands person. I did not realize how much I would learn about what it meant to learn to live together with different people and uh, orchestrate your lives around an occupation. Um, uh, rather than just going down to Occupy Wall Street for various meetings, um, what it actually meant to be a part of occupation, set up programs, set up different artistic uh, means, different uh, working groups, different uh, media means, different um, parallel educational structures. Um, that left, um, I guess, a really strong impression on me and thinking about how to not only protest against the system through achieving demands, but also about the possibilities of par parallel systems altogether. Uh, just from being there, even if my time there was not exactly the most um, happy point of my life, it did make me think creatively about different ways to protest. And when I was there the first night, what I thought uh, would occur um, as a byproduct of our occupation, I, I thought Having all these students come from schools throughout New York City into one place and work together, and I saw this diversity and uh, variety of experiences, that I thought it had the real possibility of, of actually causing a, a nationwide student occupation. <coughs> I thought that there was really a possibility that by the end of the week, uh, several city strong student occupation could cause us to think above and beyond just uh, the new school or all citywide New York schools and that there would be a reason to occupy more indefinitely until we reached a larger demand, such as possibly a student forgiveness, a student debt forgiveness. Um, and so I think what I meant previously in that um, there can be a way, I believe, in which the two ideologies can exist. Um, I thought your paper did a really good job of explaining the difference of the two ideologies, but where we can go through the motions of what it means to recreate um, a parallel system as much as possible and learn what that means to think creatively and outside of our systems to a different world that allows us some space to think more creatively about the type of world we'd like to see around us as we are working to achieve a more concrete goal. I think there's a way to embrace both. I think that the occupation really taught me that it is important to think out of the box, out of our current system. Yeah, um, well, a couple things. Um, I mean, so first of all, I, I, um, 
I appreciate the, the the vision that you have in terms of in terms of building the, the things we can do to, to build alternative education. I think there's nothing wrong in principle with that. However, I think in terms of the means of, of getting that, what does it mean um, to what does it even mean to call oneself nonviolent? What does it even mean to say that there's such a thing as being nonviolent? To me, to say that you're to say that there's such a thing as being nonviolent means you don't recognize the existence of discursive violence. So what, some of the examples we brought up earlier, these are examples of discursive violence and also physical violence that are performed in the name of nonviolence. One needs to precede the other. The, you, have to, you have to designate a population that, needs to be, that is worthy of violence um, in, order to have the, in order to have that violent enacted. But, um, so in that case, I actually completely disagree that you can neatly separate police from capital in that <coughs> sense. They have the capacity to they have the capacity to dissuade students from uh, from uh, you know participating in anti capitalist movements not only because uh, not only through the physical for physical use of violence but through the claim that there is a vi you know a violent element in the demonstration or in the movement it makes those of us who have grown up labeled as a problem particularly prone to violence think that we have to play our cards in this struggle in the form of making reformist demands. Um, from, the from the perspective of someone who has quote unquote model minority privilege, I, um, it means um, arguing, I am, a pe you know, I am a peaceful South Asian student, I work hard, I come from a hard working people, please put NYPD don't bother me. You know, it doesn't mean, it means doing absolutely, um, absolutely the, um, the opposite of looking for the alternative. Um, it means reifying their position as being able to execute um, uh, execute what you've uh, what you've pointed out the violence of naming of naming something violent. Here. You, your hand was up first. We'll go here, here, and then I'll make the comment. Not just that, but like the, the, <coughs> under any historical understanding of the border between violence and nonviolence, mm -hmm. and any understanding that's operating still in any other part of the world. Breaking windows, graffiti, and even throwing rocks at an armed police force are not considered violence. Mm -hmm. The fact that we're now calling those violence shows how much we are allowing our discourse to be affected by the state, to be directed by the state. The mm -hmm. point that our definition of nonviolence is is just nutty at this point. Yeah. And it's a way that they are getting us to capitulate to their terms. And why does the state love that definition of nonviolence? We're trying to push us so far into an understanding of nonviolence that we are rendering ourselves completely impotent. And they want us to march for one day peacefully in a mm -hmm. penned area or down a street and go be at home because that way we will definitely not have any effect. And the reason why this is important is because, I mean, we're painting a false dilemma when we <coughs> say, you know, here's these like, uh, you know, poorly socialized insurrectionist window smashing kids. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, here's the rest of us wise and mature ones marching peacefully through the streets. First of all, it's a false dilemma. Any no notion of nonviolence, historically, again, by its elaborators, has only operated within the horizon of an understanding of violence and the need for violence. And the need for that violence is the fact that the violence on the part of the state is so total mm -hmm. that, this is Fennell's point, the only way of mm -hmm. actually encountering that and confronting that is with a total violence in return. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean even, you don't even have to necessarily read that as picking up a gun. It just means that the only violence we should be talking about is the violence on the part of the state. Uh, it so induces a passivity in us. When it comes to even making demands, we make minimal ones, not ones that are maximal. Perhaps and if you, if you keep telling people that the only, op the only legitimate option of partic political participation to them is marching nonviolent in the street, which Who's we, saying we, that? But, but, no, well, but, okay, fine. <laughs> Wait, so, uh, no, so, I'm just asking. But, but that's, a def is. that's a definition of nonviolence that's on the table. We have it here. But, like, <laughs> I, so I don't really understand where this whole conversation is coming, coming from, from, frankly. We, we're but. all reading the same debates in OWS. I, I, I don't think that that's terribly far off from the, from the understanding of nonviolence that we're putting forward. And, and I was arguing against that understanding of nonviolence, to be clear, right? So well, well no, you, you just, in your, in your answer a minute ago to either Scala or, 
or Sappho said, like, you know, must denigrate the sort of insurrectionists, must instead follow the path of nonviolence, because you said that brings I'm out not. the structural violence of the state, which is what's necessary for bringing the I said in, in some in some context, right? And and like so there's a there's a distinction. In the between, context of media spectacle. Right. Okay. So right. so like so you're talking for instance for example, right? Like if you want to say that uh, that our conception of what nonviolence is is totally fucked, right? Like you're absolutely right, right? Like like a any sort of like anti-violence that we take part in is justified, give, like, like as I was saying, given the structural violence of the state. But that doesn't change the fact that like those those understandings of violence still exist, right? So if like you, you it's it's not a question of principle. It's a it's a question of like thinking pragmatically about what's actually going to work. That's all I'm saying. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and just to just to respond to your point uh, about Fanon, right? So in the beginning of the, of the Wretched of the Earth, uh, where he's talking about like an and, and he's talking about a colonial situation where the base is also the superstructure. There's no pretense of the society being founded on anything other than violence, right? Everybody. Knows that the United States is only founded right. on violence. It's a yes, colonial yeah, settler state. Yeah. A ab absolutely, right? But it's but it, but, but, but like it's not like all the masses of the people here have that same understanding the way that they do in colonial Algeria. And that means that you have to think differently about how you're actually going to get a revolution off the ground. It okay. just does. Like but, like but, you, you but, can but like Dan, speaking to precisely that point, right? Because this is the argument: if we're nonviolent, people will like our movement and will join it. And first of all, I find that very empirically questionable. And even if it does garner you some sympathy in the media spectacle, it doesn't actually mean that it's growing the movement. And as I've said to you before, if people in the movement, people after six months now since OWS started, have the experience <coughs> over and over again of peacefully marching through the street, getting whooped by the police regardless, mm -hmm. and they keep having that experience, you know what they're going to do? Turn to violence. Mm -hmm. Because if, if the message is that that's the only course of action that's legitimately available to you, and people keep doing that and getting their asses handed to them and not having any effect politically, you know we're going to get another weatherman, another bottom mine half gang, the same crap over and over again. And you you know then we'll have to have this conversation all over again. You and then I'll give a little time. Sorry, I just wanted to return the question of violence to the actual instance of the occupation itself, uh, and inside the occupation. Um, that were there was discursive and very nearly, if not actual, physical violence visited on members of the occupiers themselves. Um, there was a total lack of shared <coughs> community, uh, and there was no ability to articulate a common perspective um, or goal. Um, and and that's just you know, that's due to competing political visions, competing understandings of organization, competing understandings of what constitutes the appropriate limits of autonomous action. Um, and and I think we need to. Uh, Stop asking the question, I mean, especially for this panel, stop asking the question of the role of violence in larger social movements, although that's a very important question to ask, but to struggle as best we can with the actual instances of violence that occurred um, between groups of people internal to the occupation, because it was fucked up for a while there. It was not a safe space for anyone, right? It was, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I spent most of the nights there, so it was, you know, it was not a process. I want a communist society. That was far from my ideal of what it would have looked like. <laughs> okay, and then, um, I mean, I'll make some comments. And then some of them are sort of, uh, you know, meta-reflections based on my own generational experience and then some historical observations. And then, I mean, listening to all of this, it's sometimes stunning to me, like, how we became such connoisseurs of the politics of schism. I mean, it's sort of amazing to me that when people agree about, you know, 85 to 95 percent of things, like the 5 to 15 percent, like, get so magnified, the possibilities for solidarity among potential allies become things that inhibit constructive forms of collective action. And then I came of age in the mid-1980s, it was probably more student activism than the now, people can believe it, around divestment. Institutional racism, CI recruitment, 14,000 people arrested in the divestment struggle in a four-year period, and that was just one struggle. Okay, so as wonderful as this is, measured against other historical eras, you know, it's not, you know, apocalyptic or anything. And then, like, back then, people seemed, like, much less ideological. And there was a kind of, you know, sort of virtue to a kind of naivete. You were drawn to activism because you were outraged about some injustice in the world. You experienced it, some distant suffering, other experience whatever, and then a sense of like shared moral purpose and political affinity seemed sufficiently catalytic. Of course, 
problems were encountered around, this is the 80s, the heyday of identity politics, especially around issues of identity, of issues of race. It was deeply divisive in the you know, divestment movement. But it seemed like a long distance was traveled before you started to explore what are the irreconcilable differences. And then people didn't generally say, I'm at this, I'm at that, this is my belief, this is my theoretical frame of reference, this is the esoteric French literature I like, this is it. <laughs> and because of what's sort of in my mind and how I've identified, like, I can't be your friend. Or the barrier to us winning is false friends on the left who believe some slightly divergent thing. And then I've become, like, agnostic over the course of my not so short life anymore, about like the answer. And then I've you know, concluded that like nobody has the answer. It's not in any ism. I don't know what works in any total sense. So I try to keep an open mind about a plurality of perspectives, all of which might be able to make a contribution. And so that's just a kind of like meta point. To say, oh, let's all get along and sort of trivialize important differences isn't my intent, but in terms of a general observation of this new activist culture that I myself participate in, deeply excited by, deeply admire, it's really sort of stunning to me how invested people are in sort of points of view and how much that works against people. Then, you know, in terms of agnosticism, like demands, not demands. I mean, the master stroke of Zuccotti Park, like the genius of the whole thing was the no demands business. Right? And this is straight out of coming insurrection, but has lots and lots of sources and it kind of blew America's mind. Really, and it wouldn't have been what it was if it had asked for this, that, and the other thing, right? And then it became evident people want a different non-neoliberal world in which education is free and there aren't poor people and there's not racism, and of course there's demands attached to it. So like that was amazing. But in terms of student occupations, historically, some of the best ones have been demand-oriented. Like the most, some of the most successful student occupations in the 60s were by black students to get black studies programs. It's called the Black Campus Movement. People died all over America. Totally unwritten story in, you know, sort of commonly available sort of annals of history, you know, around things like an, you know, Africana center or black faculty or meaningful attention to sort of race and, you know, curriculum. And people would sort of arm themselves and fight police and, you know, bomb campus buildings for meaningful gains that made their education, you know, less whitewashed and, um, and exclusionary. And then in my day, you know, to get your university to divest, to get the CIA recruiter thrown off campus. And then you hold out and barricade yourself like until your demands are met and there's confrontation, there's showdown. You can have the prefigurative thing going on and it's amazing catalyst and educational experience about American foreign policy, about racism, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, my hope was that this whole thing would happen, that student issues would be emphasized in what congealed but it wouldn't be exclusive to student issues. And then over time, you might have a set of demands around student debt and whatever else that it would still be going on to this day. Like, this was my hope, right? I mean, that would last for months. And maybe you could have a national student strike, you know, kind of the student equivalent of the rent is too damn high. Like, tuition is too damn high. Like, American higher education is completely dysfunctional. And then we need to, like, have some spasmodic moment to shut it down. Nobody's going to have the answer. Not Van Sant. Everybody's salary <laughs> is paid for by your tuition. Like, it would cease to exist if, like, you all didn't pay. There's a real problem there. You're not going to win, you know, in the moment, but we need something, you know, really dramatic. Uh, okay, so that's sort of, like, point number two. Like, partly an open mind about what works and doesn't work. And then, you know, sometimes I feel like the rest of America disappears. I mean, William Buckley, you know, once skewered the nation. When Hitchens was still a man of the left and Coburn was working at the nation, they had a disagreement about something. And he said it was like watching two amoebas in a drop of water trying to scratch each other's eyes out. You know, when we talk about like the two versions of communization, a little bit like, wait a second, it's like a big country. And then, you know, the weird thing about Occupy Wall Street is like lots and lots and lots and lots of people like intuitively agree with so much of what we believe. But then there's a kind of like radical vocabulary that is so far outside mm. the mainstream. And then to work under the premise that we're in the incipient stages of communist revolution in America. Okay? And then it's, it's like, it's a, it's a useful, like, frame of reference or thought experiment, but it's probably completely delusional. Okay? I mean, there are people committed, Fox News, Hannity, Cavuto, to rapacious visions of the free market. And they probably have 50 million people who believe in that as devoutly as we believe in whatever our vision. So like the democracy issue writ large 
the plurality of points of view in America, like, is an issue and a problem. And then, like, the last point is that at some level, getting the appearance that lots and lots and lots and lots of people on our side, like, is important. And that's why Occupy Wall Street, in a kind of global sense, became significant. Because it wasn't just a handful of ideological students. The perception is it's nurses, and it's doctors, and it's construction workers, and maybe even progressive policemen, and, you know, sort of whomever else. And then the violence question comes in. Like, if you do something that, you know, as a pragmatic matter dramatically affects the perception of the popularity of this movement, it could legitimately sort of, you know, set it back. I completely agree with you. If like nonviolent people are going to get whacked by police, they're going to fight back. Period. And they're already starting to. You know. Uh, so I mean, but but you know, these these things shouldn't be separated from pragmatic questions. And I think we need to understand like the power we do have, the power we don't have. What is a stretch? What is constructive dreaming? What's the upper limit? what lesser results were satisfied with. I like what Cecily said about how people are suffering now and some people need concrete gains around things that really matter to them, having to do with dollars and cents and war and peace. U.S. out of Afghanistan. US That's out of a North demanding America. empire that to me sounds totally legitimate. You know what I mean? It isn't reifying the West. I mean, I totally understand yeah. and respect the sort of integrity of your point. But like, you know, everything should be in our toolbox. You know, everything. I do not think anything has been historically invalidated. You know, maybe a handful of things have been historically invalidated, but let's, Absolutely. you know, be greedy and, you know, um, um, permit ourselves, like, the full range of possibilities, and then I would say, like, not be so committed to, like, your truth that, you know, you foreclose dialogue, alliance, and ultimately diminish our power. Okay. Joe. Yeah, I mean, um, I think... You know, a lot of panels here touched on some of the things. Adrian's especially Adrian made me think about a lot of things. I mean, I, okay, so most people know who I am, probably some don't. I mean, I took one position on, on the occupation. The Fananian Social <laughs> Democrat with that, right? You know, okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, was, you know, the left guy. Um, you know, in the room, but, um, you know, it's, it's funny because after the occupation, so, um, a series of disagreements went on. I imagine both camps, they fissured. One camp went the other way. You guys, I think, are part of that camp. The other one went into somewhere in Brooklyn and sort of hid for a while and plotted all sorts of weird things. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's just this, this hermitism or sectarian behavior that is, that is always very striking. Of course, I took a position uh, that kind of closely resembles the other side, although it wasn't identical to what I would say. But I, I think, Jeremy, though, at the same time, you talk about the 80s and how, you know, there, there was sort of this non-overt ideological sentiment there, but I mean, there are, just as the insurrectionists have their organization, and it is an organization, whether they call it that or not, they're very open about it, they're very vocal about it, they're very visible about it, and in a very annoying way, <coughs> certainly. Uh, the other side has other organizations in concert, and I, I think a lot of them often are kind of broadly labeled Trotskyists, for, for lack of a better term, and you know, they have their own way of thinking. For them, it's building the party. For them, it's building the student wing of the party. And of course, it's not going to be an overt act. It's not going to be something where they're going to name themselves this organization, but that's just how they operate. And I imagine in the 80s, they probably operate the same thing, too. Taking on the different vocabulary of the moment, you know, not really being that critical or open about it. So I mean, I think both sides have it there. One is probably a little more overt than the other. But I, I, I find that now it's become, you know, just this odd sort of hermitism that's sort of pervasive and now what I just talked to just you know fellow students, you know, those who weren't in the occupation, what's going on, it's like, I don't know, both are kind of in their own sort of world right now. And to the detriment, right, of, of a sort of unified student movement. I remember all the way back in, you know, March and April when we were first talking about like tuition stuff. I mean it, it's and, and how frustrating it was that there was nobody even coming and then slowly with Occupy Wall Street build up and it was a nice moment of unity. Um, and then unfortunately, just things just turned out the way they did. But, right. but I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, yeah. let me just say that, I mean, I think historically that sort of organizationally cohesive ideological blocks have done disproportionate amounts of activist labor because they have skill and person power and can mobilize. 
Like in the 60s, sound systems and marches on, that was the Socialist Workers Party. Like they would show up with the sound, you know. And then that role is to be acknowledged and, and sort of celebrated. But I also think that like a large number of participants in the movements that are part of like simply don't care. Yeah. I, I mean, and I think that dynamic is, you know, true to some extent today. Right. I think the average American kid in Occupy whatever isn't thinking if he's a Trotskyist or not, or if she's a Trotskyist no, or not. You, you know, and then I think, you, you, that if you what what uh, that and that you know that's where most pe the space that most people like inhabit and then it's partly for like, reaching out to folks not to recruit but to you know inspire okay enough for me yep um, I'm not sure I have a very clear point but just to respond to the distinction that was just made that there's two camps one which is a Trotskyist camp and the other which is like an insurrectionist <coughs> paranoid delusion at best okay look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally wrote the word paranoia. On Like it seems like really, really misleading conversation. So just the sort of absence of the political is what I sort of realized most, I guess, out of the occupation. And I think charges like this, the two camps of the Trotskyists and these groups, I wrote paranoid about the ISO. Like I, you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't see this in practice. Like. Well, let me put like this one, but I mean, I'm not saying that every single member of that person is a child, just like I myself am not considered myself an end notes partisan or any kind of measure. Um, it's a weird, obscure theory, to be honest, but um, at best. But I'm saying that there are certain active members that do wish to recruit, and the manner in which they do recruit has to take a not so overt edge so as to attract membership, right? I mean, this is, this yeah, is, but look, this, is this, part of this group at the new school, they want to, they want to um, recruit. I mean, every group wants to recruit. Oh, you no, want more sure, members to do what you're doing. But no, like, you know, if, when, when Aaron like, might ask someone if, if they want to work with a group, she's not going to, like, you know, have them fill out a, a little <laughs> sheet that says, like, you, you know, what do you think about this, what do you think about that? I mean, there's anarchists that work in the group. There's, there's, so there's no, like, <clears throat> you know, when you, when you say the division isn't between Marx and Bakunin anymore, that's because, you know, uh, there, the, to me, the, the, and what I was trying to bring out when I was talking about it is, like, the, 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 the division isn't, isn't on, like, that kind of level. It's more on a, on a level of, like, orientation towards... Um, you know what you're going to do, or what you're you know thinking you're going to try to do, and and um, and there's I mean half of the half of the half of the crazy people that walk around here uh, who, are, who are who are you know so, so labeled anarchists or insurrectionists, 
I mean, they're like they're like the most Hegelian Marxist that you'll ever meet in your life, and they just crazy. So it's like, I think you gotta get rid of it. You gotta get rid of these, you know, uh, all these labels and stuff, and 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 there, you know, there's no there's no parties uh, going on. Um, okay, other points from the panel. So there's nothing quite so dangerous as a little education, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're doing very little uh, to combat the new, the, the new world uni uh, university. In Quebec, they've missed um, over half of their semester's um, classes um, because, because f f for a bunch of students in Quebec right now, there is, there is a university worth fighting for, which makes... Um, the existing university worth um, worth shutting down, and we're, <laughs> we're, we're we're quibbling over isms. If <laughs> um, Jeremy suggested all kinds of things, which might have brought this um, this panel to a slightly more sort of sensical conclusion, and UPSS has you know spent a lot of Somebody time and. <laughs> I mean, UPSS has, has organized a really, a really great two days of, um, you know, scholarly debate, and this is its crowning glory, supposedly. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you, know, you know, we weren't, we weren't, this started off before your intervention, with all due respect, we were talking about very concrete, practical things. It wasn't a flinging of isms. It was a talk about specific tactics within the... It was, it was a conversation about violence and non-violence, but... Which goes directly back sure. to occupation. No, I, what, one thing I didn't realize, or well, I mean, I didn't come up with the four questions that Jeremy um, tried, to, tried to lay down at the beginning to steer this, you know, panel on student occupations. Um, but I didn't realize that there was the need for such a kind of emotional clearinghouse five months after... The, the sort of few days of, I mean, I think one thing that might have been interesting would have been to consider whether the space of occupation has to be the university itself, um, because the really free school in Bloomsbury and the Bank of Ideas near Finsbury Park in London were really, um, really interesting kind of germinal instantiations of these, of these, you know, uh, features of, of a potentially autonomous university. Um, that is really free, you know, um, and and maybe maybe we can think about that next time we try, uh, because we we have you know we, we run into um, we run into the issue of, of respect, don't we, <laughs> towards each other when it's when it's our own when it's when it's our own university space. I don't, think, I don't think our politics is up for it. It's a few minutes past eight. Let, let me invite each of the panelists to make very brief concluding comments if you wish, and then we can take a couple comments from the floor to conclude and, and be done, okay? So, does anybody want to make some final statements? I'm going to have to think. You go, mm, you okay. go ahead. And you don't have to say anything uh, at all. Expand, escalate, occupy everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'd uh, abstain. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I think the point you raised about uh, sort of like making mountains out of uh, left-wing ideological molehills is absolutely true, right? Um, and so part of part of the the purpose of, of my of my paper here, as I, as I understood it, was to uh, talk about like what's exciting about Occupy and how it like allows people with like drastically different political convictions to still work together toward a common goal, right? Um, but there, there are questions about like what the what the like minimum uh, like shared conceptions uh, are for that sort of uh, productive political activity, um, and, and I don't I don't think it uh, I don't think it makes sense to dismiss that as quibbling because I, I think it's actually often a real a real problem like uh, that that can actually undermine the sort of uh, discussions that and cross pollination that we like vitally need to have, right? Like, I don't I don't think that like 
like just socialist organizations are going to like make any concrete meaningful change in this country, right? I think that it's a complete delusion to believe that, right? Like that you are like, you know, whatever sectarian group has the answer and they're going to recruit everybody and like, you know, bring everybody with us. But we also need to think about like how how do we actually get anarchists and and like left communists in a room talking uh, and working together towards some sort of common goal, right? I think that's the question. Okay. Any folks from the audience? Please. What was the goal of the student occupation? Right. So th that's the other question here, right? Is like I, I think that there are a number of uh, of different goals that are articulated even just in the statement, right? Uh, I identified three. Uh, but and I think and I think as I said I think that they can work together right I think that you can have this sort of like instantiation of the world you want to see the offering of free education in space but also like operating as a as a place for dialogue and building of a of a movement that will actually like affect the rest you know the other ninety nine point nine percent of America that actually like has no idea what's going on here you, you know, uh, uh, isn't that exactly the same thing you know. Um, Van Zandt is saying at the town halls. <laughs> can, you, can you explain what you mean? Like, like the, it sounds very much similar to his whole uh, social justice campaign thing mm -hmm. that he's trying to do. And uh, I mean, the language of uh, just, just to me, like just, just in the basis, it, it sounds very similar. Well, all, I was, all I'm trying to bring out here is that I, I don't think that, like, uh, that um, any one of these. Uh, goals is that answer, right? I don't think that I don't think that you get to revolution just by uh, just by creating these little autonomous spaces and pretending that we have communism. Right. But I also don't think that just going and knocking on doors like forever, uh, like you know, <laughs> till the end of civilization is going to get us anywhere either, right? So we need to be creative and like think about how these things can <clears throat> interact dialectically. The problem is when when you fail to have that sort of comprehensive conception. Thing. That's all I'm trying to say. Is like if you if you only under like if the only thing that you're concerned with is just disruption and uh, you know Marx has this uh, quote which I really like uh, <laughs> where uh, he, he and Engels are talking about uh, those who want to quote launch a revolution on the spur of the moment without the conditions for a revolution. For them, the only condition for rev revolution is the adequate preparation of their conspiracy. They are the alchemists of the revolution and are characterized by exactly the same chaotic thinking and blinkered obsessions as the alchemists of old. They leap at inventions which are supposed to work revolutionary miracles, revolts which are expected to be all the more miraculous and astonishing, in effect, as their basis is less rational. All I'm arguing for is, like, let's be rational. Let's, like, recognize the material conditions <laughs> that we have it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I, I wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, one of, uh, about um, how we conceptualize our own historical memory as a movement, um, which I find really troubling. Um, uh, first of all, this movement did not begin, the, the larger Occupy movement did not begin in Zuccotti Park. It began in Tunisia. And where is the humility on the part of the West that, you know, this, there's this reversal of this narrative where the West is supposed to teach the, the you know the non-West what it is to be liberated, mm -hmm. we are we are we have learned from Tunisia, we have learned from Egypt. Where is the humility of that? Um, where is the recognition of what did it mean when people were in Tahrir Square saying solidarity with Wisconsin? Mm -hmm. You know that that solidarity is supposed to be something that only comes from the north down, you know, southward, and that the reversal of this paradigm. Um, and I think that recognizing the, the the neoliberal university not only is a neoliberal university but also is a neocolonial university. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the international, the, the global hegemony of the American university, I think something that absolutely needs to be part of this recognition. But I think also in terms of the historical memory of the movement, um, I am so tired of hearing Americans talk about the 60s. I, it, it, it makes me feel ill. I don't care about what happened in Paris in 1968. Uh, I don't care about the Port Huron <laughs> Statement. You know, the Port Huron Statement was being, was being written great. You know, my, my mother was, you know, trying to overthrow the government that the right-wing repressive regime in her home country, which this country installed, you know, at the same time, and like, um, so this, 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 the, the whiteness and the and the and the, and the westernness of, you know, this this collective historical memory of of the movement, along with you know our our our, our you know our obsession with French and German philosophy, um, is is really you know we have to disrupt these genealogies, we have to disrupt these narratives, we have to be you know questioning, you know, we we cannot allow. Our, our, our analysis of, of capital to end at the borders of the neo-colonial nation state. Or the neo-colonial university. 
um, if you don't mind my butting in, because I think that hege that discussion about hegemony that you're talking about globally also plays out locally with Occupy as well. Where is the position of the of an occupation of the new school in relation to, say, something like Take Back the Bronx? How are we, you know, we talk about having a university worth fighting for. Perhaps the problem, the problem um, has something to do with the fact that we don't have a city worth fighting for. We don't have a conception about what radical, uh, what radical people of color are doing in their own, con uh, in their own communities and how they're reacting with their constituencies. Instead, it always has to speak back to here and to our own conceptions of ideology and our own historical movements. Uh, I just figured out my final comment. Okay. Um, I guess uh, in lieu of the conversations about violence, nonviolence, etc., uh, I think that what it comes down to for me is is a matter of where we can and can't work together. There are ideological differences that will disallow us to work together on occasion. I, I do believe in nonviolent tactics. Um, that's not to say that I would spurn anyone uh, <coughs> about taking a, a different route. Uh, I think that what we have to do moving forward is be transparent about our goals moving forward to organize um, actions about the things that matter most to us uh, and to show solidarity and work together where we can. Uh, the point is, is we're not at the end goal where we would like to see our world at this moment. There's got to be a lot of actions taking place at a lot of places all at once and this, like you said, it's, it's a toolbox and I think that we should learn to work together where we can, respect the times when we cannot, and not take that as a matter of us and them. Um, I think we can respect each other as individuals and the fact that we're all actively trying to oppose an inhumane society. Okay, and then I, I have one last thing. Um, justice never sleeps, and then there's an event I'd like to invite you all to. I'm going to pass around flyers, and this is a little self-serving, but it's for a worthy cause. It's called the Human Face of Indefinite Detention. Shaka Armour, Guantanamo, and the NDAA, and then there's like a global campaign to release Shaka Armour as there is to release all the men detained without charge or trial at Guantanamo. He's the last UK resident to be held there. He's been held there 10 years without charge or trial, certainly tortured. He's in like absolutely terrible shape. His attorney, Ramsey Kassam, will be speaking, as will the world's leading researcher on the detainee population in Guantanamo, and then the former chief prosecutor who quit and discuss and this is co-sponsored by some groups here, and Witness Against Torture and Amnesty International. It's on Tuesday before a meeting at 8 called by the Philosophy Club about politics at the New School, and if anybody wants to have a kind of marathon day and make both, I deeply appreciate if people will consider coming to this um, event. And then I thought this was really, like, really rich and rewarding and fascinating, and we rose to the challenge of the moment, and I think we've